Welcome back to the podcast that exists to enrich and inspire young Latinos. Bienvenidos al podcast que existe para enriquecer e inspirar a jóvenes latinos. Bienvenidos, welcome. Gracias por escucharnos una vez más. Y el día de hoy tenemos una invitada muy, muy especial. Uh, we have with us Micaela Vargas. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Micaela Vargas. I was named after my grandmother on my father's side. Um, she had 12, uh, 10, 12, 10 children and my father was the, the youngest of them all. But um, I have never gotten to meet her because she passed away six months before I was born. But I was born on her birthday. So they named me after her. If it wasn't going to be Micaela, it was going to be Michael. And um, she probably went by the nickname Mika. So I also do the same. My family and my friends, everyone close to me also calls me Mika. So that's a little bit about me. Wow. Your name after your grandmother. So I'm pretty sure that means a lot to you. You grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, South side of Chicago. South side of Chicago. <laughs> uh, you study international relationships. Mm -hmm. And today you are the head of uh, an important organization in Chicago. Tell us a little bit about your work there. Yeah. So I serve as the executive director of the Chicago Latino Caucus Foundation. So it is a nonprofit organization that was created in 2016 by the Latino Caucus members. So city council, uh, the city of Chicago, they have 50 aldermen, of which 13 are um, Latino Caucus members. And so they got together and realized, you know, I think we need to really start having an active role in some of our young um, people's opportunities and creating a pipeline into jobs, uh, internships, just really preparing them for, for um, not only the job market, but personally and professionally, well-rounded individuals. Latinos have a lot to add into the city. We are, um, you know, the latest census came out. We're the largest minority population in the city of Chicago, and we're only 40,000 people less than um, our Caucasian residents. So we are a big force in Chicago, and we wanted to really create opportunities. Uh, we do so through the Leadership Academy for mid-level professionals, and then we also... Um, created an internship opportunity. So we give $5,000 scholarships to um, college, undergrad college um, students. So that's a little bit about the organization. And I serve, I've been there for close to two years now. And it's been my first nonprofit initiative. But um, the work that I do with the caucus and these young people is really inspiring to me every day. So I love it. Yeah. Mikaela, what, is, what does that mean for you, you know, to grow up in Chicago and now lead an organization that is having such a big impact that is not only creating a big impact in, in real people's lives, but also it, you just educated me, you know. What does that mean for you as a, you know, young Latina growing up in Chicago now to, to be in a position of influence? So what I'll say is, You know, growing up in Gage Park um, on the south side of Chicago, I this was an interesting time in Chicago where in that particular area, there was a lot of thriving businesses, but the opportunities weren't what they are today, right? We had one high school to go to, our community high school, unless you tested into a magnet school, which I did not. I did have pretty bad dyslexia growing up in grammar school. So I never got really good grades and I liked school. I just wasn't, I had to really apply myself in order to be successful. And at that time I was just more interested in making friends. And, you know, I looked back on a recent report card my mother showed me and she's like, every time you brought back your report card, it was like solid C's, maybe, you know, a B trickled in. But they would always say, she's just a social butterfly. She needs to, you know, pay attention or not talk so much. And I'm like, well, hopefully that paid off for me in the long run, because looking at the position that I have now, it's all through relationships that I've was able to get to this pace. 
So not only cultivating relationships, like starting a new network in Chicago, a professional one, right, outside of my personal life. And it is really, I'm, I kind of look back and I'm in a bit of awe of like the fact that I have taken on the leadership roles that I have in my career so far and that I only know that it's the beginning and the impact that I want to create is not what I would have imagined for myself growing up in Gage Park. I was just wanting to be accepted by everyone. I didn't really care about my larger impact. I just wanted to feel included in some way because in a lot of ways I didn't feel good enough. And so I spent like a lot of my high school years, even younger than that, just trying to kind of like go one day to the next and make it through school. But there was a lot of times, you know, kind of I had to make a big shift when I was 16. I moved out of my parents' house and um, into my um, living with my aunt and uncle in a in a completely different city and experience completely. Going from Curie High School on the south side of Chicago with all Latinos or African-American, like, young boys and girls to an all white school. It was an interesting jump for me. Um, but I think I would have been very proud of me if I were looking back on myself right now. So. Michaela, you say uh, that uh, relationships are important. And, you know, as I see you as a, as an important leader in the city of Chicago, that advocates for the Latino community. What relationships keep you grounded in, in your life? Mm. Well, you know, I think I look at my life in a really holistic point of view. You know, starting with my relationship with my parents, I have both my parents, I'm very lucky that I have a very strong relationship with them. Um, my mother has, you know, completely given herself to her children. And you can see in a lot of different ways how I've taken a lot of those cues from her, I guess, so to speak, because she is extremely selfless, like has really given a lot to not only her family, but her community. That's where my parents, that's how they taught me. Like I've, I'm very blessed to have parents that, you know, my mother and father met at in Casaslan, which is a community center in Pilsen back in the seventies. And my father was a muralist at the time, a painter, a activist in a lot of different ways. He did it through the art form of painting and um, creative energy. And my mother also was a participant and just really kind of community organizing. She was a school nurse, like really helped out for after school, um, like initiatives with the kids. So they met and a Mexican and Puerto Rican met in, in Pilsen, fell in love and, and had children. And I, w I came pretty late. I was kind of like the, I, you know, I was, I was the youngest of them, but they always taught me growing up, like you have to give back ever since I was eight or nine, like anytime there would be a volunteer opportunity or going back to Casaslan, I did two years of after school programming where I'd help the kids and do homework help or clean up the neighborhood, anything that had to do with giving back. They really instilled that in me. So my relationships with my parents is really important. My father's like one of my closest friends. We're very, very close, but I think I really had to develop the relationship like within myself. I just had no sense of, I was, there's no other way to put it. I was so lost for many, many years, even after college, like you, you get the sense that you're, you're developing a little bit more of yourself in college for sure. That's what I did freshman year. I, I barely made it into college. I was waitlisted actually at DePaul because my grades were so bad that my freshman and sophomore year. And I was able to turn things around kind of like end of junior year going into senior year, but it wasn't like enough to 
you know, make me a stellar candidate for any college application. But I did apply to DePaul and I got accepted eventually after getting waitlisted. And I saw that as like my opportunity to reinvent myself. And uh, I had never really been to the north side of Chicago, like maybe for to a Cubs game or, you know, on a car ride going, if we were like going to the suburbs or something, like I never knew my life outside of my neighborhood. I loved it so much. And my parents, you know, we, we had, you know, grandma's house, our house, that was it. So it wasn't until I really started to develop a relationship within myself, like what it what is my intuition saying? What am I feeling right now? Am I tired? Like I, I would run myself, like I would completely burn out because I would try to work, 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 work. And I had no idea how to really kind of, you know, garner that relationship with myself. So those are only a few I can go on and on, but you know, if we're talking about relationships, some of your closest family members and, and to yourself are very important. Yeah, uh, it's it's so beautiful to hear the the huge impact and how dear to your heart uh, your parents are because I feel that um, you know I I came from Mexico at the age of fifteen, but um, I remember you know my parents saying, you know we're gonna go and and work hard and look for a better future and you know I'm never gonna forget you know those words from my parents like we came here to build a better future and. Um, in your case, your parents, you know, gave back to the local community and that's what you saw. Uh, and that's what keeps you grounded today. So that's, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, one of the things that you said is I was lost and, you know, I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, especially growing up, uh, in, in, in this country and, you know, a lot of the people that we serve here in Iscali is, it's difficult to be a first generation Latino student. It's, it's difficult to be the first Latino in a classroom. It's, diffi it's difficult to be the first Latino in, in a position. And um, uh, there's a lot of social pressure, but there's also the the personal stuff, this, the family issues, the economic issues, the financial stress. Um, so I feel that all of us in one point in a, in a different way, in one way or another, we have been lost. Um, uh, what do you think were the, the, the sources of resilience and hope in, in your life and in the most difficult moments? Hmm. There have been what I would say blessings, but probably the age of 14, I had my first mentor. And she was somebody that came into my life like unexpectedly. There was a Latino debate team that was citywide. And my father was talking to a cousin of mine. And she and he was saying, oh, Mika is just not doing well. Like she's just, you know, making a lot of bad decisions right now. She's not going to school. And my cousin was like, oh, my best friend is the um, leader of this Latino debate team. Have her get involved. Like, you know, they learn about different social issues. They learn how to debate it in a uh, formal way. Like they go to competitions all over the state and the country. And so I kind of like shrugged it off. I tried not to do it. I tried to like, you know, they, they were just trying to get me off the street basically because <laughs> I just wanted to go outside and you know, do things that I should have been doing my homework. But um, she was, her name was Janet Padilla. And she kind of always was the one to text me like, hey, are you coming to practice today? Or, hey, are you going to um, like commit to this competition we have coming up? And I would always kind of like, again, it's almost like a rejection of help when you are feeling either so emboldened that I could take on the world by myself. Like, you know, when you have that mentality, like I don't need anybody. And it's just like, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. Like I didn't like 14, 15, 16, definitely. I just was like kind of taking out my anger on everybody else around me, even when they were offering me help. And that's why I'm so grateful that my, I had people in my corner that really stuck by me. But so her in particular, she kind of kept in touch 
and so much that every opportunity that she had after that, you know, we made, you know, we were close for the six months that I was in the program and then a year. And then she gave me the opportunity to coach the next class coming up um, in the program. And so I did that. And then she flew me out to Detroit. It was my first time going on a plane like by myself. I thought I was the coolest person ever. But she saw like, hey, there's this competition in Detroit that you should be a part of. And I said, well, I don't have any way to get there. Bought my plane ticket, gave me a place to stay. She was living in Detroit at the time. And ever since then, we've stayed in touch. I'm now 31. Okay, so this person has been a part of my life. And has been so influential. Every book she's reading, she used to give to me. When I went to Japan, she like hand wrote notes of where I should go. In Japan, she had this like travel guide. And so it was those people in my life that were such blessings. That That's just one example. I have many, many of them. And I have become a collector of these beautiful relationships that have not only served me because now I'm in the position, right, as a person in the community that has some authority, whether it be within an organization or we have these scholarship opportunities, right? Like I'm just trying to provide more information to the group. I now go to her and say, hey, you should be a part of this group. Hey, what about this contract? I know now you're doing some work on your own. Like we should work together. So it's like a mutually beneficial relationship. And that is, those were those like little glimmer of hope growing up where I saw a Latina doing amazing work. She was like at the Ford Fund. She worked for like this huge company. I saw a woman in business and I'm like, how can I be like her? She was living in some high rise. I'm, I'll never forget this. Sorry, I'll end here. But basically she was living in a high rise that you could see the lake. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is like goals. Like, this is how I want to live my life, too. Because when you see someone that looks like you doing amazing things, is super successful, is not ashamed of their of their success, you want to try to emulate that. So those were those little nuggets of, of really kind of encouragement and hope that I got over the years that really helped bring me forward. Yeah, you mentioned a keyword. You said, my first mentor you know, at the age of 14. Um, what do you think uh, it, the role of mentorship can have in uh, among the Latino community? The acknowledgement of the fact that I had people that were in my corner looking out and even when I was trying to reject the help, were so pushing to try and help me. Like heads and shoulders, I know that I was, you know, far ahead of, being given opportunities than many people have. Like right now, recently through your organization, I was talking to one of my mentees and she was never, she didn't even understand like the application to college was already difficult, right? So she's helping out her family. And, you know, I've seen so many people beforehand that just didn't have the opportunity to meet these type of people that you're like, oh, I can look up to them, right? Because they're in just survival mode. You have to apply for a, a college by yourself. You have to apply for financial aid by yourself. You have to work. You have to take care of your families, your siblings, your children. And so what I would do is just stop and say, okay, let me, let me switch my mode because it does require a mental switch from, from going from everything is happening to me versus what can I control in my life? Because even if you were to Google mentorship programs, there are formal, free, open to, you know, Chicago residents. Sometimes they're specific to college students. Sometimes they're specific to high school students. If you dig enough, you could potentially look for those opportunities where you can apply. You can start, you know, Sometimes I, I think we underestimate speaking our intentions and how helpful that can be. Because sometimes when you're just in a conversation with a friend of yours and you can say, man, I've really wanted a mentor. Like that's something I would want. Speaking that 
you can, and you say it in as many circles as you can, people want to help. I think legitimately people are very good and they do want to try to see how they can help. If it's something as simple as I know someone that is in your field of interest that I can connect you to and see where that relationship takes you. But the number one thing, because you can find a mentor at the grocery store, right? You can find a mentor bagging your groceries or Mm -hmm. stocking the fruit. You have to have the skills of garnering and nourishing relationships because luckily if i had one skill that god just be, like said here you go you you may not be able to read really well <laughs> you, you switch your b's and d's and right like you you, you can't speak spanish that well but there's one, <laughs> right but there if there's one thing you know that he's like okay you're gonna be good at making friends <laughs> just you know having the the thought of let me write a handwritten thank you note little things like that remembering someone's name writing it down on the back of the business card once you meet them if they hand you a business card the first thing i do is they mention that their son played baseball next time i reach out how did your son's tournament go like those little things of remembering someone's like if they tell you something personal keeping that like as if it were a treasure it endears people to say, okay, how can I help you? So all of that to say, there are endless opportunities for those that want to seek it out there, but it, it is the, the mental switch of asking for help and also, you know, just saying, I deserve a mentor. Like that's someone that I would want to have in my life. I can have it. Yeah, that's beautiful you, that you say that, right? Uh, asking for help is so hard. For some of us, it's hard for me when I need help to ask for help. And sometimes I think it's part of our culture, you know? Because like you said, uh, if God can give me a, would, would choose to give me gifts, uh, would choose, would give me the, the option to choose my gifts, that would be the gift that, uh, that I will choose. Talk to me about your relationship with God mm. and how that was developed and that came in, in, um, into your life. Because sometimes talking about God or talking about relationship with God is not necessarily popular or accepted. It's like, ah, oh, you know, you're a monjita, you know, mm. go, and, go and talk about God somewhere else. How did that came into your life? Were, were you always kind of a spiritual, religious, or was there a moment in your life where you're like, I need to pay attention to this? Ooh, okay, so this one is interesting to me and I don't mind sharing this part of my life because it has really brought me to this place where I have a beautiful and intimate relationship with God. When I was growing up, I was raised Catholic. So I did baptism. I did confirmation and communion and um, I did it at the church that my grandmother served. Like it was a very familial experience on Sundays and we always used to go out to eat as a family. Like it was you know, Sundays were a thing that we would really celebrate together. But, um, and this is just like a small caveat, but being Latina and not being able to speak fluent Spanish, it really, I went to a Spanish service and, um, you know, my father emigrated here from, from Mexico. My, my mother's Puerto Rican. They both speak Spanish, but they really encouraged us to speak English and we spoke English at home. So, uh, it took me a while to kind of get over that, that first hump, but, because growing up, I couldn't really understand the, um, you know, mass to a T, right? Like all of the sermon, I didn't really understand. I didn't really fully kind of comprehend like what that relationship was supposed to look like. I just thought, okay, Sundays we do this thing. And, you know, I didn't think much of it, right? So I turn 19 and I'm in college and I enter into a relationship um, and he was, you know, he had his faith and was very, um, you know, attended church and really actually gave me my first experience of, hey, let's go to church together and, you know, understood that there are different ways that you can really show up in your spiritual like experience, right? Like having a direct line to God, you have all the time. And so you can really sit in, in prayer. I, I just never really understood that. Well, but in that relationship, I was really young. He was very young. And there was a lot of 
negativity that also surrounded religion and spirituality. And we had talked about this before where I actually felt in that relationship being so young that my my faith was actually weaponized against me where I couldn't, I was very much controlled in that relationship and to a T, like I couldn't, couldn't speak to certain people, couldn't wear certain things. I had to show up the way God wanted me to, what would God think? And I started to be, have this mental shift in all through college and after college as well. And although I'm so, 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 so grateful for that experience of having introduced me to, I guess you could say church or my religion, it was really a first introduction to like my experience directly with God. And for a while there, I needed to take back control of just saying, no, this isn't like God isn't ashamed of me. Like I don't, I had a lot of shame, a lot of guilt that I carried for many, many years because of this experience in a very human experience, right? Like we enter in and out of relationships all the time. But it wasn't until I decided I made the the choice myself to to find a church, to go on my own, to get baptized. Um, I was baptized on a in a church um, that I still attend, <laughs> and so it's been twelve years. But uh, my journey has really centered me, and I get this a lot. I'm in politics too, right? Like you know, dealing with elected officials every day, dealing with individuals, there was something I always knew about having such faith is that you should have people that have strong faith in all different industries. You don't need to just be a pastor or, you know, serve in the church as a job in order to have that really come through in your life. I wanted to serve in politics and be faith driven. And so, or in elected positions or in public service, like it, I see it as a mission, right? Like you are showing up the way that God wanted you to in these, you know, not so very convoluted, very distracting places. You bring a lot of clarity. And there was one thing I'll never forget a conversation I had with a colleague. He's like, why, why do you believe in God? And, or, you know, why, why are you so, cause I wasn't very like showy about it. Like, you know, preaching for my gospel every day, but I, people knew when people just know just by the way that you show up, that's, that's the way that I wanted to represent my relationship with God. Right. Like I really took the time to pray before I, you know, eat something, something like as simple as that. And I said, the reason why is because I don't want to be wherever the wind takes me. I'm not trying to go. I want to be roots down centered so that when storms come or the wind starts blowing, everyone around just starts going with whatever wind is like I'm rooted. I have values in X, Y, and Z. Like it's typed out for me. I believe in them. And that makes me feel like I can be show up as a better person each and every day. So that's, that's the relation. That's where it started. It kind of started in this weird way where I was, you know, I had this relationship where I didn't know how to feel around religion and I felt a lot of guilt and shame, but I made it my own. And I started to say, okay, now I want to serve in the church. Okay. I do accounting. Like I, I do like the back end, like, but that's a service, you know, you serving people, you're serving the community. And um that's why it still is really relevant to me today. As you look at your life now, uh, what would be your advice to the younger self? And and the reason I ask that, Michaela, is because there's a lot a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are young people that you know have this question. What does God have to do with my life? And why is that important? Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I would constantly deny myself. Um, deny like trusting myself. And I would go with external factors, right? Like what did my parents want from me? What do what does my partner want from me? 
what does my school want? Like, how can I make my change myself to fit into these roles that everyone wanted me to play? And the reason why I started to really kind of explore that side of myself because I needed something to hold on to that was firm, that was resolute, that was unwavering, like the love that God has for me, that I could say, hold on to that while developing like myself. And so that's something I would go back and tell myself, like, first of all, don't be so hard on yourself. Like, I was almost borderline mean to myself. Like the way that I would talk to myself, oh, you're so stupid. Like, how could you, like, you're bad, you're not good, you're not good. Like, these were things that were consistently replaying in my mind for many, many, many years. And so that would be the one thing. Don't be so hard on yourself. Be kind. Like, what would you tell a little girl? Like what if a five-year-old just like spilled that milk like you just did, would you call her stupid? Because <laughs> that's what I would do. Oh, she's such an idiot. Like that. And then so now, even when I, you know, it's easy to slip up and do it still. But I say, no, you're not. Like you're a good person. You made a mistake. So that's one thing. And, you know, to to really kind of... <sighs> It's easy to be selfless and call it like a service. But when it's at the detriment to yourself, like I was consistently denying like self-care, um, like I just wasn't in a healthy space. And I would just say, well, I need to give. I need to give to everyone else around me until there's nothing of me left because that's the only way that I could be good enough. That's not the case. So those are the couple of things I would say. And, and that's why I found, you know, and for, for the young people that are listening and they're feeling, I don't have a relationship with God. I'm interested, but I'm, I have so many other things right now. I can't, I can't even think about it. Sometimes holding on to something like that is so firm, it can ground you so well that then you can go and explore and what life has to give. You can go and find your purpose and your mission and things like that when you have your set of values that then require you to be tested. Because I was being tested all the time and consistently failing. So it wasn't until I took the time to really dedicate towards myself, towards my relationship with God, that I was then, okay, now I can go out in the world and fight and have that purpose and be and live up to what you know my dreams are. Michaela, thank you so much. That I'm taking all this advice. <laughs> Just so you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, thank you. That was that was very profound and beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, thinking about the the future of, of our city, Chicago suburbs. Um, what would you like to see Latinos achieve in the next ten years? Ooh, okay. Now <laughs> I'm excited for this question because, um, listen, so much, right? Like I could go on and on. Latinos are so incredibly powerful. It is, it is incredible. Our fa our family um, ties, like the the like specifically in regards to Latinos, like the commitment that we have to our families is just unwavering. I mean, we are willing to go to the depths of wherever um, to make sure that our family survives. They eat, they they have success. They're taking care of children. You're taking care of your parents, your elderly parents. Like they're with that quality if we continue to even expand that further, Right. The only thing that I would love to see Latinos really capturing is is this part of themselves, right? Like you do need to take care of yourself before you take, can take care care of others. But um, like I said earlier, we're the growing the the fastest growing population, not only in the city of Chicago, in the country. 
pretty soon they're all eyes are looking on the uh, Latino community right now to see what we are preparing to do because in politics specifically, they have a history of ignoring our vote, ignoring us because, oh, they don't come out to vote. Oh, they're undocumented. They, I'm sorry, we pay taxes. We go to the military. We serve our country. We serve our families. And you know the other thing? We are one of the biggest economic engines in this country. The amount of businesses Latinos start, just, it can't, there's not a lot of competition out there. When I was growing up, a tax, uh, like a taqueria on every corner. A, you know, like I had my haircut, Latina woman. I went down the street. I had my shoe cobbler. I had my tailor. I had my dry cleaners, all Latinos, all Latinos, like the corner stores, the grocery stores. And that's why Latinos and specifically you ask, what's something that we're going to be doing in the next, I, I'm, I'm already saying it, we're going to do it. Latinos have a history of going into new communities that are debilitated, they're put off to the side. No one wants to invest because they don't see, you know, the vision for that neighborhood. Latinos go in, they start one business. They they take they're risk takers. We're risk takers. We buy the house where we want to build it up. And, you know, there's no there's abandoned houses around us, but don't worry, like we know and you we get in early and we build communities that way then one business comes and then a nonprofit comes and so that's what I see for us really reclaiming our power I, I think right now we tend to not speak up as much um, but I've never seen now I represent the Latino caucus I've never seen the Latino caucus come together like I have this year specifically around uh, policy changes in the city that are affecting Latinos, they're all sticking together. And that was one thing that I always looked on, like, wow, a lot of other community groups, they're really big coalition builders. Like, Latinos can be really fragmented. You know, we got the Cubans, the, the, the Mexicans, the Mexicanos, the, like, Puerto Ricanos. <laughs> well, right. But, like, and that's a real, th um, that is a a problem like we have to mitigate and i think we're starting to do that like now people are starting to realize oh wait divide and conquer that's like a real thing let's come together michaela uh you know you said it latinos are the fastest growing population in the nation yeah we need to be united um uh, something you know i'm very passionate about is or students are not graduating or young people are not graduating college um, we continue to be fragmented, you know. Um, what should we be paying attention as as a body, as a community in the nation in the next in the next ten years? Yeah. So I think as a nation, the right now, in terms of getting out the vote, in particular, white women are known for being a really good population to count on, right? Like th the way that politics works is, especially in campaigns, just to break it down really quickly, is especially when you're talking about a policy or looking at wide, widespread change, you look at your base voters who are going to vote for you kind of no matter what. Like who are, who are the ones that you can count on that – typically come out for your initiative, your candidate, X, Y, and Z. And then you have your swing voters, right? So the individuals that are could go either way. Like they're the ones you want to market because you need that extra margin to win because you're counting on your base plus a little bit of swing. And then there's the voters that you typically don't want to spend money on, time on, because they're never really going to understand your message or they're not going to um, – you know, vote for whatever you're interested in voting for the candidate because of where they solidly typically lie. And I think, and I, I, this is what I'm predicting because Latinos tend to be, we're kind of all over the spectrum. Like you have very conservative Latinos that um, have conservative thoughts. They, 
um, vote as if Republican, which is completely fine. And I think there is a beautiful thing about that in particular, because we have, you know, let's just call it the, the progressive Latinos and the conservative Latinos. That means we have so many opportunities to win seats, to win in, we can win a seat in Texas, we can win a seat in California. And those are very different places, but Latino voices heard is something that I think in the next 10 years is going to really explode because they're going to start to understand you can't ignore the biggest subsection of the entire country and and that our voices are going to be heard to get us on the boards, get us on commissions, elect us into top positions, hire us for even the deputy positions. Like that's my strategy right now for like looking at Chicago and our leadership academy How do we get people in the deputy positions, like top, like right before, so that they can grow into their CEO position, C-suite? And we're having a lot of success with that right now. And so we're, it's just like building a base. It's typically building a bench. You're building the bench for the next person up because pretty soon, you know, that person is, is looking for a new position or retiring. You're up because you have that experience. So that's what I would look at as a nation just because of like the variety that we have in our community. I'll finish with this conversation. What's, what's next for you in the next five to 10 years? Ooh. What would you like to achieve in, in, in your personal life and your community? So I have really dedicated essentially all of myself and all of my free time in the past year and let's call it like 10 months to myself to my personal self, um, exploring what I love to do, what I don't like to do. Like I love to paint, never realized that. Like I actually really love to do puzzles and I'll stay home now. Like before I used to be like, okay, it's Friday. I should probably work. Uh, I need to go to this, a work event, like just thinking of all career, career, career. And now I'm like, no, I want to stay home on a Friday night and I want to do a puzzle because that's what helps me rejuvenate like my mind. And I like spending time with my family on Sundays. And I realized that when I'm able to walk and work, so like if I'm talking to someone, I get a lot more creative, like with my ideas, if I'm walking, I'm exploring all parts of my personality and I love it. So with that, in the next five years, I'm just continuing to do that, continuing to like express myself creatively, uh, creatively, um, just build better relationships with my family. I'm getting a lot closer with like my siblings. And because if I'm being really honest and transparent here, because I do think like something I actually told myself uh, in the beginning of this year is Mika, I want you to be more vulnerable. And I'm like, oh God. Vulnerable. What does that mean? And then you called me. And you're like, be on this podcast. And I'm like, okay, this is God telling me. Here's your op. You wanted an opportunity to be vulnerable. Here you go. At the core of me, I think that I was really hiding. Like there was two Mikas. There was the Mika that you would see because I wanted you to see it, and then there was the real me. And what happened for so many years? No, my entire life. I started to believe like I actually thought that version that I was projecting onto you was me. And so I've just just gently, gently is the key word, been removing the facade of who I thought I wanted to be, who I needed you to think I was. Because at the end of the day, I always thought, the way that I'm going to get someone to like me, approve of me, not talk bad about me was to give them what I think that they wanted, which was, you know, X, Y, and Z, call it what it is. And so what I realized is that I was showing up very differently with my family than I was with my friends. Or um, basically, I was showing up one way with my family and then everyone else saw a different version of me, friends, colleagues. So put the rest of the world into that category. And I was like, wow, that's so interesting. Like, why am I one way with my family? Like, I'll never forget. I'm a very like lovey-dovey, you know, just happy and joyful person. Like I kind of 
want to always be positive and I don't mind giving like hugs to my friends and saying, you did a good job today. Or, and one time I gave my sister a really random hug, like a, a thoughtful one. And she's like, Oh my God, like that was so nice. Like you've never done that. And I'm like, what? I remember it was like over Christmas. I remember thinking, wow, I'm, I have to be the very stern person in my family. Cause I feel like I would, I needed to play a role as the, this is what you have to do. This is like, I'm, I'm the youngest of the family, but I tend to like have a lot of say and they look to me for advice. And, and I took on this role in my family where I started to lose a lot of my identity. I just became what, like the identity that they wanted me to, you know, what, and what's crazy is they didn't even want that for me. Like I placed that on myself. So for the people that are right now, like, kind of like feeling this story, like they're like, oh, that's me. What's happening is you're placing those expectations on yourself, showing up in a certain way that like even your family doesn't, like they think is authentic, but just take a moment and say, how do I want to show up? Okay, I just want to be the daughter for a day. Go and be the daughter. Don't play the mom role. Don't play the big sister, little sister, big brother, little brother, you know, grandchild, like just be Mikaela, be, you know, ex, you know, put your name in that moment and show up the way you would authentically show up with anybody you're comfortable with and try that with a new person you haven't done that with. You'd be very surprised. Mikaela, que honor <laughs> platicar contigo. Honor. Uh, I I know we will be hearing from uh you know you making big difference in, in the city of Chicago and I'm excited to see you maybe in the future of a diplomat. You want mm -hmm. to be a diplomat. I so. sure do. <laughs> <laughs> you will see me at the United Nations one day. Yes, uh, I I'm looking forward for that. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you and thank you for all the insights about your own personal transformation and your own journey. Um It's been refreshing to me, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be refreshing to everybody listening. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Awesome. Thank you for listening. And if you found uh, this conversation insightful, uh, please share with somebody. Thank you. No olviden seguirnos en Instagram y en Facebook en Iscali Podcast. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Iscali Podcast. Listen with us and experience the joy of the gospel. Escúchanos y experimenta la alegría del evangelio. Te esperamos. Dare to dream. Atrévete a soñar.